Okay, so um, I'm going to do a recap real quick. Um, basically, at the age of 18, um, you start working with Spanish Fly. And yeah. then, uh, then you, you got into working with the And uh, can, uh, again, for the record, how many records did you guys sell of, of High Seas record? High Seas record, we went gold. We sold 500,000 copies. Uh, the, and once again, those were units, whether they were cassettes, whether they were albums, or whether, the, you know, whether there were CDs at that time, because we had CDs already. But we sold 500,000 right. copies, and for me, that was mission accomplished. That's where I was actually happy, because that's actually all I really wanted. I wanted a gold plaque, and we were able to achieve that my first time out as being a producer. That's awesome, man. Thank you. That's like a someone's dream, really, you know what I mean? No, it, it, that's exactly what it was, man. You know, and it's funny because I know Be Real probably won't remember this, but on my album, we had DJ Quick on there, we had Second to None, we had AMG, and we had one song where we were trying to get Be Real on there, but their album had just dropped, so they weren't trying to do any features. You know, so we didn't get a chance to get him on there, but later on in 1997, I got to record with him, and uh, I did a song with him. Yeah, man, and I think that that was at their peak as well, because Cyber Zero was huge back then. Yeah, they were, and we did a lot of shows with them. We've been we've been homies ever since then, man. Yeah, shout out, be real, man. Uh, another thing um, that we were talking about was uh, Bobby from Lighter Shade of Brown, and uh, you know, rest in peace to him. I actually got to work with him a few times and, and go on the road with them. Uh, um, how was it working with him? Well, you know what? I never had the opportunity to work with him because he called me. And, of course, they liked that flavor that I did when I sampled uh, I'm Your Puppet, and we made a song called I'm Not Your Puppet. Then on another mm -hmm. song, uh, we sampled Billy Stewart sitting in the park. So he liked that OD feel. So since yeah. they did Sunday afternoon, they wanted something like that, like a follow-up. So he had hit me up. But I just kept telling him, I'll try. I'll try. It's just that I was just really busy. Then Frost calls me back then, and he wanted something, you know, dope like that but i just didn't have the time man and i really really wish i would have made the time because i got so busy i missed a lot of opportunities i missed opportunities to go to japan to go to australia to go to canada uh to go to europe and i missed out on those and those opportunities never actually came back around because i was so busy here where i should have just stopped production and just went yeah and that's crazy, man. You you were you were you were in the era where it was going hard. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, and, and you know what? It's funny because my first tour was in Texas. You know, I actually still have the calendar of where we stopped. I know we stopped in, uh, you know, Fort Worth. I know we stopped in um, Beaumont, and uh, um, uh, I believe it's Tyler, uh, Corpus Christi, Houston for sure, El Paso. Um. But all, all over there, all over there. I mean, I, I believe I still have video of me at a club in Houston. It used to be called the Palladium. And that was early 90s. And then I went back like in 1997 when I was producing Mellow Man Ace's album. And it was now an all Mexican nightclub. You know, so before it was just like an all black nightclub. Then like six, mm -hmm. seven years later, it was all like Spanish, like, you know, banda type of shit. Yeah, I, I remember the Palladium. So, so when you were coming out touring in Texas, who, who were you with? Oh, uh, I, I was DJing for High C Number One. That was my artist. Uh, second to none, AMG and uh, uh, DJ Quick. So all, all all of us were on tour together, and uh, I was the one DJ for all of them. Okay. Um, I'd hate to bring this up, but I know you bring up DJ Quick, and I know you were one of its producers uh, at the time, but. Uh, I, I've brought out um, MC8 out here to Texas, man, and you know, I really didn't know too much about what was going on at that time, but um, I uh, ran into the thing about DJ Quick and MC8. So were you around when that whole beef was stirred up? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny because I, I'm going to clear the air on something, and if you like, I'll actually even send you the the interview that I did with his ex-manager, who was our manager at that time when we were on the road. His name's Greedy Greg. Uh, uh, he lives in the city of uh, Inglewood, and that's where all of that stuff was recorded. 
Quick's first album, Second to None's first album, AMG's first album. And I remember Quick did a song, and it was just a demo. Uh, it was just a demo, and I, the song was called Real Dope. And all he mm. said was, uh, I climb up on, on top of the tree for CMW to see. And, and mm. then he said, uh, that's me. It wasn't even really like a diss. To me, a diss is telling somebody, you know, you know, go fuck yourself or something, you know? Yeah, yeah. But it wasn't really even a diss. So MCA took it to heart because Quick was from Treetop. So he said, climb up a tree for CMW to see. It was more like a subliminal blood and crypt type of thing. And mm. uh, I guess MCA didn't like it. And that's where that whole beef started, you know? But um, but it was just like on some street level shit. Then mm -hmm. I I told him, give me that song. I'm going to put it up on my mixtapes because my mixtapes were selling way more than his ever were. So right. actually, on my mixtape is why that song got popular. And uh, I, I still have it. I can send it to you if you like. That's dope. So uh, what are the titles of those mixtapes? Oh, man, there's so many of them. Because, like, okay, Dre did the mixtapes from 84 to 87. And when I say he did them, that's why I sent you that uh, my documentary with a one-hour version. Uh, right. He did them for this Japanese vendor uh, by the name of Steve Yano. He, uh, when I say Japanese vendor, he would sell them at the swap meets. Some people call them flea markets. And uh, Dre was doing it for him first. Dre passed the torch on to me. So now I went from DJing to become a mixtape guy. And I did that from 87 to 91, uh, dropping mixtapes. We, we had a tape called Bullshit. We had a tape called uh, um, Eight Ball, a tape called uh, High C. We had a tape called um, uh, Scanless, uh, Recop. Like, w whatever word was trending at the time, that's mm -hmm. what we named uh, those mixtapes. Okay. You know? Okay. Dope. So, so you worked with, with Dr. Dre before? Yeah, just on the mixtapes. Just on the mixtapes. Mm -hmm. I, I like to make that clear because I don't like... I had people try to call me and say, what production did you do with Dr. Dre? I never said I did any production. I just did mixtapes. And I do have, I mean, where he would come to my house and do them with me, um, Easy e and Ice Cube, you know. And, I, and I'm just going to keep it real. No other Mexican dude can say that. No, mm. other, no other Chicano can ever say Dr. Dre, Easy e Ice Cube all came to my house and they wrapped on my mixtapes. Uh, um, nope. and, and, and I'm going to be real with you. No other Mexican dude could say they were in the studio with him. You know, I was in the studio when they were, uh, uh, not, I don't want to say every day, but I was there quite frequently seeing them put all the stuff when it came down to the Easy e the NWA, the Michelet, the DOC, and the Above the Law stuff. You know, and I interviewed a lot of those guys here on my platform where they all confirmed that that was true. Right. Yeah, shout out to DOC, man. That's one of my guys right there for sure. Oh, yeah, and he's from Houston. He's from Dallas. Dallas. Okay. Well, one of those, because I know he's a Dallas Cowboy fan. So, yeah. but now, was the Fila Fresh crew from Houston or from Dallas? Fila, I don't know nothing about that. So, it, it may be from Dallas. I'm not sure. Okay, because I know he was a part of the Fila Fresh crew, and Dre brought him out here. So, okay. uh, for some reason, I always thought they were from Houston. Hmm. Yeah, that's crazy, man. And, and I just seen him working with Dr. Dre again. Yeah, um, you know, I was trying to do some more work with him, and uh, he was like, "Man, I'm right now. I'm busy. I'm tied up to the beginning of the year. So you know, hopefully, after the beginning of the year, I can definitely get back in there and get some production done with him." Um, Absolutely, man. Do you think? Uh, do you think Dr. Dre had any kind of influence on your producing at all? Oh yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. Uh, uh, I, I think it was more me watching him sample on the SP-1200, the drum machine, mm -hmm. because it, it wasn't like he was telling me, I'm going to teach you. It was just me watching him. But I will right. say this. When I got my first drum machine, my manager, rest in peace, is a Japanese vendor named Steve Yano. I didn't know how to use it, and, and that manual was like this thick, bro. And mm -hmm. I wasn't going to read that shit. So mm -hmm. what happened was uh, he took me to Dr. Dre's apartment, and uh, um, he had no furniture, bro. Dre's apartment had no furniture. He was still broke. And I, I set up the drum machine, the mixer, and the turntable on the floor. And believe it or not, we both laid down on our stomachs, and he showed me how to sample. He's oh, the one that showed shit. me how to sample. He's the one that showed me how to uh, uh, 
what a bar was. He actually okay. told me how to count bars. I didn't know what a bar was. He actually That's told true. me about BPMs, about temples. I didn't know what a metronome was. So I was going into production totally blind. And I had somebody legendary like him, you know, not knowing who he was going to become, actually teach me, you know. <clears throat> That's crazy. That's a crazy story. Um, share with us um, uh, a story with you and Easy E. You know, well, you know, it's funny because Easy E said something. On, uh, I believe it was a uh, dope man. Uh, in the very beginning of the song, had a guy knocking, and they opened the door, and it's kind of like a visual that you see because there's no music. And uh, somebody says, "Who is it?" He said, "Oh, it's me, man. I got something." And then they say, "Let me see it." He goes, "Oh, it's this gold chain." And they said, "Oh, y'all Mexicans are always coming with this shit." <laughs> now that was something very, very controversial back then. And it had a lot of Rasa really pissed off. Yeah. So I'm in the studio. Everybody walking. When I say everybody, Ren, Yella, Dr. Dre, walk out of the, the, the main uh, 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 boardroom. Easy, easy, only one left in there. So I take it upon myself to ask him, what was all that about? You know, and he said, what was all that about what? And I said, you said all y'all Mexicans are coming with this shit. Like we're all crackheads or something. And he said this, look, I'm only sharing what I used to do in the neighborhood. He said, I used to sell the blacks and Mexicans. That's all I used to sell. Now, hmm. I told him my story. I said, I never sold to Raza. All I used to sell to was whites and blacks in my neighborhood. Hmm. So he said, okay, well, see, that's your story. This is my story. He said, right. but at the end, he said, at the end, I kind of balanced it out because I had crazy D who talked a little bit of Spanish, and he said, Dear Mr. Dope Man, you think you're sick. You sold crack to my sister, and now she's sick. But if she happens to die because of your drug, I'm putting in your culo a 38 slug. So he mm. said, so I kind of had like a Mexican threaten us for selling dope. Mm. So I understood, but that made a great conversation for us. And ever since then, I'm not going to say we became the best of friends, but we became close enough where I had his number, and I can call him and ask him, you know, whatever I wanted. You know, but I will say this about Easy. First and foremost, rest in peace. Because when people talk about rappers that died, he is mm -hmm. the guy that gets least mentioned. And, and for me, his music is what I think changed the world as far as that sound. You know, and, and I, I believe he deserves his flowers. And, and that guy, I will say this, being a Mexican in a room full of all blacks, not only him, but all of them never made me feel like I didn't belong there. And, right. and, and that, for me, that was a beautiful thing. Man. Do, you, do you think he was set up? You know, a lot of people are talking about his death was set up. Do you think that, or do you think it happened natural? Well, uh, I'm going to say something without mentioning names because I know a lot of stories and I know a lot of people. I've been around a long time. Uh, somebody very, very close to me and very close to him straight told me Easy E was murdered. Hmm. And and he knew it. A lot of people don't know that Easy E received a letter from the FBI that the KKK had a hit on him. Not only him, but Rodney King. A lot of people would look up Rodney King, and there was another minister, like a preacher minister from LA. Now somebody close to Easy found out because Rodney King, who got beat up by the cops, and Easy E were good friends. No, Rodney sure. King. Yeah, talk to Easy and said, did you get your letter? And he says, what letter? He said, well, this mm. letter from the FBI. And pretty much when Easy E's close friend contacted the FBI, they said, well, you know what? We don't know why he didn't receive it yet, but we'll make sure to get it out to him. Okay. Well, the letter pretty much contains stuff like that this KKK doesn't come with white hoodies. They're going to come as police officers, as judges, as lawyers, et cetera. Oh, wow. Yeah, so there's a lot of stuff like that, bro, that, I mean, I think I might have even said a little bit too much there, but this person yeah. never, wants, never wants to go public with this. Right. For sure, so, man. Um, yeah, it's definitely a touchy subject. Um, 
So yeah, man, that's 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 good history, man. And, and and just to know that you're a part of it, and that's that's another reason why I wanted to get you on here, so so others can know who you are. And uh, for the ones that don't, you know, and you know, basically build the connection, man. And uh, you know, it's been a long time coming for the Chicanos, uh, for the Mexican rappers. Period. To 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 come together and build this build this bridge, you know, over this huge gap that we have from Texas to Cali. And not just us, but for New Mexico, for Colorado, for Arizona, for everywhere. Uh, and, and everybody watching, man, I just want everybody to know that, you know, we're, we're trying to bring that together. You know what I mean? And, uh, um, you know, we can get some guys from out there to come out here, work, maybe start a whole tour off of this and, and, and go on. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's a good thing that me and you met up and, and or you got your platform, I got my platform, and, and I think that, that we can go forward with, with these platforms, you know. I think it's time, especially now that we have the technology. You know, I I, I tell people all the time, you know what, uh, um, you know, we can go live on Facebook, we can go live on YouTube, we can go live on Instagram. The only thing that's not free is Wi-Fi, you know. So we have the tools and technology now to move forward because I believe, and I'm, I'm only speaking for California, you know, Rasa mm -hmm. is hip hop economy out there. You know, we buy all the merch, we buy all the music, we buy all the tickets. And Facts. yet we're still, on, we're still on the sidelines watching the parade go by. And we so, ain't making no money. We're not capitalizing like everyone else is. Nobody. We're, we're too busy making everybody else rich. That's and then we're, we're, we're too busy beefing with each other. Not, with just, each other. not, not just Texas versus Texans, but Californians versus Californians. You know, uh, everybody in the Midwest is against each other as far as Raza against Raza, Mexicans against Mexicans, whatever you want to call it. And I just feel like some of that needs to stop. And I feel like people need to come together and together we can form something great and we can get those checks like everyone else has been getting. Absolutely, man. You know what? And, and, and I don't say this like in a bragging or the cocky way, but I've gotten those checks before in the past. I'm not talking about now. In the past, I've gotten those forty-five thousand dollar, twenty-five thousand dollar, eighty thousand dollar checks. You know, right. I've gotten those. I've had my own place. I own my own house. I had my own brand new Mercedes Benz and my Cadillacs. And but you know what? That was then. You know, right. but we should be able to get more now. You know, if we just connect and do good business together, and let's just be honest, stop hating on each other, bro, because exactly. we're just doing it for ourselves. Exactly. We're just doing it to ourselves, you know. You, you know, uh, um, one thing I will say is that for some reason, Rasa thinks that on top there is only one seat. So we need to, every time somebody tries to climb up, we yank them down because we want that seat, not knowing right. that there's plenty of seats up there. Plenty. I mean, well, every other race has plenty of seats. You don't see, I mean, BET was formed for the blacks, and there's so many powerful people that came out of that. They came from nothing, you know. Uh, not even that, you know, I, I like to speak about uh, different regions and different, uh, uh, like, okay, e even the white guys, they got certain places that, that they travel, you know, like Bubba Sparks and Jelly Roll and all these guys, you know, these like MGK and all of them guys, you know, they, they created a lane with the white folks where they tour all through those neighborhoods and they get rich from it, you know what I mean? So, the only thing we're missing is that to happen for us. You know what I mean? And uh, it's like you say, everybody's always yanking somebody down. But I feel like we can capitalize it. And there could be a lot of you guys in Cali that, that could become rich. Just like down here in Texas, we can become rich. You know what I mean? Absolutely, man. I, I, I have to agree with you 100%. But that, that's going to have to start a stop, man. Because, look, let's just be honest. I got into this podcasting business in September 11th of 2019. There wasn't mm -hmm. too many podcasters out here. Today, people have turned something that could have been beautiful and organic into reaction videos and dropping cheese men and talking shit about others. That's exactly. what podcasting has become out here. And honestly, it disgusts me. And that's why I have said to myself a time limit of where I may just stop podcasting because of what is it. It has become, you know, people right. think if I just drop cheese, man, if I start talking shit about that dude, start talking mm -hmm. crap about her and, and just kind of give a reaction to how I feel, 
I'll get the views and get that monetization check. You right. know, and that's what it has become, man. And it's sad, but, you know, that that's what we do to each other. You know, and I want to make it clear while we got everybody watching is, uh, you know, there's been a lot of negative stuff going on, but that's not me and that's not my personality. I just reached out and, you know, try to protect Carolyn from getting bullied. And you know, somebody had to speak out and say something, uh, you know, and I've been waiting for it to die down, but people keep bringing up the subject. So, you know, with that being said, I, you know, I just want everybody out there to know that I am here to work with everyone. You know what I mean? Um, all of the negative stuff that you guys are seeing, you know, it, it's because people ask for it, you know, and somebody has to stand up for that. And, and that's the only reason I went online and I did that. But other than that, I don't even want to get on that subject. That's a whole right. other ball game. I just want to stay on the positive note and I want to bring people together, you know, and that's what I'm about. And I'm about the business of, of, of the, you know, the music business, period, you know? Absolutely, man. That's a good thing. No, but you know what? And I try to stay away from all that, you know, because I've had people that have wanted to bring negativity and beef to my platform, and I won't do it. I said, that has nothing to do with music, bro. Exactly. It has nothing to do with music, you know? I don't charge people for interviews. You know, I don't ask people for favors. None of that. All I do is give shine, especially to up-and-coming artists, whether you're black, white, Filipino, Mexican, Samoan, from Honduras, from Venezuela, wherever, bro. It doesn't matter. But I do like to focus in on our people. I really do because coming from a, a, a place in time where I started, there wasn't enough of us at all. You know, right. we didn't have a, a voice now. I mean, back then. Now we do. You know, now we do. So I, I like the fact that we have created platforms to shine light on our people because, you know what, our people have a voice and it's time for people like me and you to be a voice for them, open the doors for them so they can have equal opportunities like every, like all these other artists. You know, right. I mean, think about this. Let's just, let's just call it Rasa. Where is a, a, a Mexican or a, I'm not even going to say Mexican, just Rasa in general. Uh, Rasa Snoop Dogg, Rasa Kanye West, Rasa, if you will, 50 Cent. Do we have any of those people? Right. You know, not in not in America, maybe in other countries, but not not here in America, no. You know, yeah. and, and and if you really think about it, why is that? We're pretty much getting screwed over, man. And we're being derailed left and right, and they want us to fight with each other, and they don't want us to elevate. But I feel like. There's so many millionaires in the world. And this is the crazy part. I feel like, you know, Mexican rap is not new. You know, we've been around for a long time. But I think that our platform is new, and I feel like a lot of millionaires, I feel like it's we're, we're back at the beginning right now. We're, yeah. we're back at the beginning. And uh, it's a lot of new stuff to come out of this, for sure. Right. And, and again, today, you know, like I said, we have so much exposure that we can use for positivity, for our music, for our image, okay? But you know what we're using it for? To talk shit about other rappers, you know, right. to, to give reaction videos. You know, back then, if you didn't belong to a major label, most likely you weren't going to get known because back right. then you had to have bought magazine ads. You had to have bought airtime, what we call payola. You know, you right. had to have bought, you know, benches, uh, 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 um, um, bus benches to put your album cover. You had to have bought billboards to put your album, you know, to the people that was coming out. If you didn't have a budget for that, most likely you were just going to sell your stuff at the Swan. I belong right. to a major label, so I had major uh, distribution. But now we speed up now. Look at all the technology that we have. And yeah. we're using it all for the wrong reasons. Some of them are using it for the right reasons. And I applaud them. But some people use their platforms for, for wrong reasons to to. to to uh, talk about somebody else so that they can get popular. I'm not for that, bro. Yeah, I'm not either, man. I, you know, I, I'm really against that. You know, sometimes we do got to address what's being said out there, and and it's okay if they shoot you, you know. If they shoot first, that's you got to respond. But at the end of the day, man, it's all about positivity. Uh, I, I, I do want to see us grow, but we need people to come forward and be like, you know, and, and humble themselves a little bit. You know, and know that there's a bigger picture out there for everyone. You know, um, bro, 
I feel like 2023 is going to be the year. You know what I mean? I feel like I it's going to so. be. I feel like it's going to be a year, especially if we can bring it together. You know what I mean? Yeah. Definitely got to bring it together. And uh, I hope so. You know, a lot of people have been screwed screwed over in the in the music industry. Uh, let, let's talk about that for a little bit. I know, um, I know, down in Texas for sure. Um, man, there's so many legends right now that don't have ch that didn't ever receive no checks from great music. You know, legendary music. Does that go on in Cali a lot too? Yes, a, a lot. Like, like, okay, let me give an example of this one record deal that this one guy told me, he said, Tony, he said, can you look up, can you look at this paperwork for me? Okay. Now, this is a Rasa record label. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this artist is actually pretty damn good. And I said, what are they offering you? And he said, they're offering me 20K for two years. Right. Now, 20K ain't shit, bro. Right. So I said, okay, ask him a few Ooh, questions. Yeah. Two years? For, for two years. Yeah, so, yeah. so, so, I mean, let me tell you something. For an independent artist out here, that's a big one. I wouldn't take it, but that's a big one. That's, that's highway robbery. So right. I asked him, ask this record label owner, um, ask him, how many albums does he expect in those two years? Is the 20K recoupable? Do you have to pay it back? Okay. Mm. And ask them, uh, uh, um, are you going to get the 20K all up front? Well, he said this. He came back and he said, the 20K is recoupable. I have to pay it back. And I go, so he's mm. giving you a loan. And he said, yeah. Then he mm. says that he's only going to give him five grand every six months. So every six months, he gets five grand, five grand, five grand, five grand. That's 20K. Yeah, and he wants six albums in two years. Hmm. Okay, so here's what I'm thinking. Here's what I told him: He's gonna sell your stuff and pay you every six months. I said, yeah. for minimum wage, you can make more money in a year working at Subway. Yeah, but that is what we are doing to our own people. We are we are saying. Viva la raza, let's come together, but yet we're still ripping each other off. True. So, you know, true. Uh, out here, without mentioning any names, out here, there's four, I don't want to say major, but four independent Chicano rap labels, okay? Mm -hmm. And isn't it a coincidence that all the rap labels owners rap? Not one of their mm -hmm. artists that they signed has ever made it bigger than the label rap owner. I wonder why. Well, because they're trying to keep us down. <laughs> you know? We there's do it to ourselves. There's a few millionaires in Texas, and they all got camps. I mean, I'm not going to say no names, but, you know, yeah, that, that they didn't treat the artists fairly. You know, you, I mean, well, you know what? I was just talking to um, DJ Kane from the Cumbia Kings. Are you familiar with him? Yes, yes, I am. Well, he he went out and uh, for years, bro, they got a whole history of nothing but it's big tours and everything, and some of these guys still have to work construction. That's crazy. It, it is crazy, bro. It, it is crazy. I, like, that I don't get. Look, look, here's my thing. Okay, let's just take Suge Knight for an example. Suge Knight, okay? He had Pac. He had Snoop. He had Dr. Dre. The dog pound at that time, probably the, the the biggest independent death row record label in the world when it came to rap. Probably some of the most yeah. talented rappers at that time ever. He had Dr. Dre, producer, you know, the, the, the goose that lays the golden eggs. Instead of taking care of them and making them all rich so that he could be rich, he decided to rip them off. Right. How, how can a person do that, man? Yeah. It's crazy, man. Yeah. People living off of hard working artists and giving them chunk change instead of taking care of them and blessing them, blessing their families, 
Make them happy, bro, to be working for you. Take care of them, but they don't, you know. And and look, I, I've never tried to become a manager, but I work with plenty of artists. And this is one thing that I've noticed about artists. I can meet mm -hmm. an artist that could be dead damn broke, eating top ramen and spam every damn day from the dollar mm -hmm. store because they cannot afford a meal. I know that they're talented. I'll start working with them. I'll start getting labels interested in them. I'll start getting them paid shows. Mm -hmm. And before we can actually even finish a six-song demo, their head is this fucking big. That's I another problem that we have. <laughs> see, I can't deal with a person like that, bro. I won't. I won't. And I, I won't do it again. It's called, um, what do they call it? Um, when you feel like everybody owes you something. Uh, what is it? Uh, entitlement. Entitlement. We're living... And, and the generation right now where everyone feels entitled. Yeah. Whatever. Bro, bro, let me say this, okay? When I started this podcast, I reached out to a lot of like Chicano, like rap legends out here because mm -hmm. I hadn't heard of them like in years. So I wondered what the hell happened to them. So I mm -hmm. called them up and I gave them light. I gave them their flowers. I gave them their shine, something that was due to them because nobody mm -hmm. else was talking about them. Right. Then... Before you know it, they ended up turning their back on me and started talking crap about me and saying that my platform blew up because of them. It happens. <laughs> it happens. But at the end of the day, you got to look at people like uh, DJ Academics. He's creating a platform for a lot of artists because he's on here all day. You know, um, man, look, you know, I don't want to go too long. Because uh, my phone's kind of dying out on me right now. But look, man, I, I, I do appreciate you for coming on. Uh, give me five different California artists that are Chicanos or Mexican, Raza, whatever you want to call it, that people in Texas should look out for. The, the first person that, that I'm going to mention, well, two people that I'm going to mention. Number one, I'm going to mention Magic Girl because I'm producing, well, I'm co producing her EP. Her shit's going to mm -hmm. be. That's one person that I want to connect you with when her stuff is done. Okay, and maybe you can get her out there on a tour or something. Okay, for sure. Magic Girl, DJ Dominator, an amazing producer. DJ Dominator. Look, I, I know Dominator, and man, Dominator is the dopest, man. People don't know. See, like, they, they don't know Dominator out here, but I do. I actually went out there to Cali, stayed at Dominator's house, and, and man, that dude is a musical genius. Like, yes, he is. Yes, he is. As a matter of fact, he's producing along with me Magic Girls record. Hmm. That's dope. So, yeah. So be looking out for that. Those two. Another guy that I believe is really, really dope, and, and I love the kid. And I'm gonna say it, and I told him to his face. He just needs direction, and that's Cujo the Savage. Hmm. Cujo, the, Cujo can rap his ass off. Another dope rapper has a dope voice and he has dope production. Is a guy named Misfit Soto. Okay. Okay. Miss Pesoro. Now, another guy that's up and coming, and I'll give him his flowers because he's been working hard for it, is a guy named Bozo. So okay. those are my five right now that I believe, uh, 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 if they stick to it, can really make a career out of this to the point where they don't have to go to work or they don't have to, you know, struggle to feed their families. I was just checking out Bozo's music, man. Uh -oh. I see that he had a song with King of the G. And, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm I'm interested in working with everybody, bro. I don't have no hate with nobody out there. Uh, I, I I was looking into uh, Magic Girl, uh, and um, you know I would like to work with her too. I know she has a story. Uh, definitely, man. We want to be out here with open doors for everyone out there, and especially if you send them out this way, you know you say, hey, you got to make the connection. I'm with it. You know what I mean? Uh, for for. Uh, just for the record, nobody out there, you know, as far as Chicano, Mexicans, Raza, we have nothing negative to say about any of them right now at all. You right. Know what I mean? It's all love, it's all, man. It's all love. You know, it's, a, it's it's clear. Everything's clean slate. And I, and I would like to keep it like that. I would like to do good business with a lot of people, bring them down and give us some of these Texas promoters and uh, run them through here. Man, let's, let's, let's get the money. You know what I mean? Absolutely, bro. Absolutely, man. But thank uh, you for giving me the opportunity, man. 
uh, for, for those watching, man, can, can, can you drop your social media one time? Yeah, my social media is at underscore Tony Vision. At underscore Tony Vision. I don't spell it any other crazy way. Just regular Tony Vision. That's my Instagram. And then if you want to follow me on, on my YouTube, it's just Tony Vision. Look me up. You'll see my you'll see my picture on the profile, and there I there, there I am there. Uh, uh, if anybody wants to submit their music, and wants to interview on Rodium Radio, uh, uh, hit me at rodiumradio at gmail dot com. Rodiumradio at gmail dot com. Submit music, a short bio if you have one, and uh, somebody will contact you via email. For sure, man. And I'm definitely gonna come out there with you, and I'm gonna you know do something on the Rodium Radio with you for sure. Um, Please for good. those that are tuned in. If you're watching right now, go ahead and hit that subscribe on my Instagram or, or hit the follow, like, whatever it is. Uh, you, you can follow me on uh, YouTube at the Hot Seat 713. You just put it all together. The Hot Seat 713. And then you can find me on Facebook. I know a lot of people still on Facebook. Uh, add me to uh, it's, uh, Mo Hustle. M-O Hustle. Um, there's, there's a space in between. Mo Hustle. Um, cause if it ain't Mo Hustle, it's a slow hustle. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but uh, but yeah, man. Much love to everybody tuned in. Y'all follow me on all those platforms. Uh, I would really like to uh, get you back on here, maybe in a week or two, just to do a little follow up recap. I, I know the the uh, the internet's going in and out, and all kind of stuff is going on right now. Um, but much respect to you and all the hard work you put in. And, man, I just want to give you your flowers, too, you know, coming from this side, man. You know, that's what Thank we you. needed. Things like the you, – well, I know you're familiar with Drink Champs, right? Yes. And so I like the way they go on there and they say, man, first of all, I want to give you your flowers. And everybody claps, and it's a good thing, you know. But we need to do that for our own people, too, you know. Absolutely. And, and just give everyone their flowers while they're alive because tomorrow's not promised. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely, man. Absolutely. But so, yeah, salute to you, Big Dog, and uh, for sure, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in continuing the conversation another time, hopefully in a week or two, And because uh, I know we just got so much to talk about. You know what I mean? Absolutely, man. So stay blessed, my brother. Merry Christmas. God bless all you guys. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody that tuned in. So we out of here, and but we're definitely not done. We, we will continue this. For sure. Much love, man. All right, brother. Yeah. Stay blessed.